Welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we some of the art and science of games. We have a very interesting cast lined up tonight. For those of you who don't know, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding wargaming, the developers behind World of Tanks, World of Ships, over the last few weeks at the time of this recording. And there's been issues regarding their monetization models, how they're treating their community members, and so on. And my guest tonight is someone that if you are familiar with our round table, ooh, excuse me, if you are familiar with our round tables, should be well accustomed to. And he has firsthand knowledge of working with wargaming over the last few years that he wanted to share. And normally, I don't like to jump on, you know, the uh, whatever the news of the week kind of topics are. But this is something that is very personal to Ramin, and is a very important topic to discuss. So. I figure this is a great way to do it. So, Ramin, it's a pleasure to have you on. Unfortunately, it's not exactly the best of circumstances for our cast tonight. Uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, the situation's a little bit unfortunate uh, with the uh, players are uh, at the point where, at least the influencers, uh, seem to be rejecting some of the products I designed mm -hmm. uh, back in 2014. Yeah. And... Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't blame them, uh, given the circumstances and, and, and the things that they're concerned about, I have no control over uh, yeah. since I left the company in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it would be useful not only for, our, uh, for the gaming community, but even for wargaming themselves to go back and explain how we got here. Mm -hmm. Because I don't even think... Uh, you know, given turnover and how much secrecy there is working in a Eastern European company, that there's probably very few people that really understand how we got here, even inside wargaming, and probably no one in that company has the full story. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what we're going to talk about today might even help wargaming. At least that would be my hope. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. and there's certainly a lot to discuss. So. For people, I guess, uh, I guess the first question for people watching this right now, what was kind of your role at wargaming, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with them to catch them up on. Right. Uh, well, I was going to go into that, but but generally, um, my official title was created by me as an attempt to obfuscate what I really did at the company, mm -hmm. um, because. That's just how we rolled at Wargaming. Um, you know, we tried to, you know, not let everybody know. We were doing some very cutting-edge stuff, and we didn't want competitors to know that. Um, my official title was Game Economist. Um, but really what I was doing, it was uh, game neuroeconomics or metagame design, mm -hmm. uh, which meant I was really starting to get into uh, trying to make games that met the needs of the consumer directly not just psychologically but biologically mm -hmm. and uh, to catch people up on uh, do you want to talk about what's going on with war gaming now or should we save that for a little bit later into the cast well if you feel comfortable describing what's been going on with influencers with like the mass walkout and stuff the you should might as well go for it Okay, and then we'll kind of start at the beginning. This way, everyone will be like kind of like on track. So, for people watching us right who don't know what is happening, like I said a few minutes ago, uh, war gaming developers of World of Tanks, World of Warships. I think they even have. I think a, do they have one about airplanes now? I forget. No, yeah, they, World of Warplanes. I think actually came out before World of mm -hmm. Warships, but okay. I, I, I that's the one I didn't get to work on because it was in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian war was was in full swing okay. during the development cycle. So what is happening right now is that there's basically been just a huge community backlash against wargaming and World of Ships. And looking at what other people have been reporting over the last like two to three weeks, it has to do one with how they're treating their like community ambassadors and you know the streamers and influencers who are like you know, the most horrid fans. And this is not the first time they've done this. I know they had this huge fiasco with a uh, 
influencer who was like breaking down issues with one of their uh, pay to win tanks or their pay tanks. And I think Wargaming like blocked them. They uh, issued DMCA strikes and just a very, very nasty time all around. Now, the other thing that's going on, what's kind of from the monetization standpoint, has to do with the ship that. Uh, from what I claim, and for those of you watching, I did not play a World of Ships, so I don't have first-hand knowledge of this, is that the ship was originally released with yeah, kind Warship. of like... World Warships, thank you. It had kind of like a, a credit booster, so if you use the ship, you get more credits, which in a game that is built on you know, resource usage and progression like that, something that gives you more credits means you can do more in the game. And... From a lot of people, they say it kind of like broke the economy in a way. Because if you have a ship that gives you, I don't know, like one and a half to two times more credits, that lets you get back into the fight quicker. It lets you, more importantly, not to spend as much money on getting those credits. And Wargaming basically turned that ship off for some time. They said you can't get the ship anymore. It's done. And then as yeah, of... The Missouri Battleship. Yeah. And then as of like a month ago, or maybe a few weeks ago, at the time of what we're doing, not only did they bring the ship back, but they brought it back in a loot box form. And I don't, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, did World Warships have like a loot box economy at the start of the game, or did that get added in post-release? There were absolutely no microtransactions in the design I completed in okay. 2014. Mm -hmm. so Unless this was... you count just buying cur currency at microtransactions. Yeah. So they added the ship back as a loot box, and it's a loot box chance. So it's not like I spend $20, I get the ship. It's you have to keep spending money, get the loot box, and hopefully that ship is part of it. So not only do we have a loot box system, but this is very much like a pay-to-win example. If you get the ship, you get more credits more than anyone else who doesn't have that. And... That combined with their original stance of not bringing the ship back, and then they decided to bring it back, but in this way, has basically led to like an almost like all-out revolt by their major influencers and streamers who are still covering the game. And when we talk about like live service and community engagement, this is the complete opposite of what you want to see. You don't want your entire community to revolt over decision. I remember uh, with Payday, with Overkill Software, when they add in loot boxes, and it almost completely scuttled that game. Like, people were leaving in droves, and they had to completely reverse course on that. And, you know, there's suddenly a lot more discussions about free-to-play monetization design. We've had several here, I'm sure we'll have several more, but that should catch everybody up as to what's going on. So, I'm going to throw over to you, Ramin, and I guess, like, take us back to, like, where you want to start with our conversation. Okay. I mean, I want to keep the focus on, on Wargaming, but mm -hmm. just a little bit of background might be helpful mm -hmm. uh, about who I am, uh, for those who don't know. Um, I, uh, my background before I got into gaming was uh, physiology, neuroscience research, uh, especially neuroscience uh, of addiction. Um, I worked with Olympic athletes to try to optimize their performance. Uh, I'm very interested in, in how the body and the mind works. Uh, in 2000, uh, in April 2000, I went to the Los Angeles Times and, and partnered with their tech editor to write the first article uh, describing, the first mainstream article on, on virtual goods sales. And that became a passion of mine. I actually ended up making my living pretty much from then on, or most of my money, uh, income, just selling virtual goods. Um, but it, by April 2000, I was concerned that, that this would become a more of a widespread thing, and if it did, uh, that it might significantly damage the, the gaming experience for players, um, which, of course, it did. Uh, but I predicted that in this paper, and that was my concern. I wanted to... to send a warning to the gaming industry that they should change some things um, if they didn't want this gold selling to direct their games. Uh, they didn't respond to it the way I'd hoped. They just saw it as like a PR problem and tried to cover up as much as they could, but didn't change anything. Um, so things just continue to get, to get worse. Um, I ended up becoming a gaming journalist myself, covering the MMO space, uh, 
consumer advocacy, and of course, game economics uh, through about 2005. And then I ended up applying to Sigil Games as a game economist in 2005. That was the first time I had ever applied uh, as a game economist. Um, uh, but when Microsoft dropped Sigil, and uh, I knew that when that Sony, which was their pickup publisher, wasn't going to full, uh, additionally fund them. They were, they were just going to go to market with what they had. I knew there was no point in pursuing that. Uh, that's when I decided that I was going to start developing the field of game economics because I see it, saw it as something essential if you want to continue to have uh, open worlds with player-to-player trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, without that, I could see that free-to-play, uh, especially Eastern free-to-play, was just going to tend to take over the Western market and, uh, and that these economies were all going to stop working. So I, I had hoped that would not have taken me as long as it did. I was working double full-time on that, and I thought I could solve the problems I set out to solve, especially the, the economic problems of World of Warcraft uh, within a year, but it actually took me four and a half years, including a, a return to school to study conventional economics. Mm-hmm. Um, so the result, my solution paper was 35 pages titled Sustainable Virtual Economies and Business Models, which I completed in 2009. And I uh, used that to apply to a, a number of PhD programs. I had hoped to teach the first generation of game economists to help continue ma- uh, supporting the creation of these open worlds, which were so successful prior to that time. Um, but a couple things happened to stop that. One was that um, uh, another PhD that was in the loop that could prevent me from getting my PhD uh, wanted to be the, the pioneer of game economics. And I made the mistake of uh, letting him know that I was ahead of him in game economics. And uh, so he sent me a very threatening letter, and all of my PhD applications were rejected for non-academic reasons. That's the only thing they would tell me. Um, I, when, I, when I would later get hired at Wargame, I actually saved this, these threatening emails from this professor and put, put them on the wall in my <laughs> office so everybody could read them. Um, but, so, but instead, so instead of going into academia, I went into industry, which was not easy because the idea of an economist working in games was really quite foreign to industry back in 2009 and even 2010 and 2011. Um, I eventually got hired by Microsoft uh, as their first game economist in 2012. And I was also working with uh, Take-Two. Uh, uh, they had tapped me to help with um, Civil and Civilization Online. Uh, Civil, I came in mostly as a post-mortem to explain to them but they wanted me to, to tell them what went wrong with Civ World, which I did. And then they told me we had this secret project, Civilization Online, which got me very excited because I'm a huge Sid Meier fan, a huge Civilization fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I created some of my most complex models ever for Civilization Online. Um, but then the, um, the Korean developer uh, told me that they didn't want an American in their studio. Mm. under at least not working there and under any conditions so i didn't have confidence uh that they would be able to do that without me so i ended up uh encouraging take two to cancel that project so if you've never heard of civ, civ online i suspect that's why <laughs> i mean uh you know working with sid meyer was a, a bucket list moment for me and uh I would have loved to have seen that game make it to market. But <clears throat> my, my first responsibility is to make sure that, you know, my employer and their investors don't lose money. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw that as an inevitable outcome under those conditions. And uh, I, uh, I was just going to say, I think what I find very interesting, something that we brought many times, is that what you're talking about in terms of this timeline was still like 2005, 2008, you know, like kind of in that period where, like you said a few minutes ago, 
people weren't having these discussions about monetization, free to play microtransactions. And we've had like these like joking talks about how, you know, the industry. I remember that thing you post about like with the person with electronic art. So, like, ran out of a, a committee meeting or a uh, investigation in terms of microtransactions. And that was, that was Disney. Oh, Disney. And I'm about to talk, and I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> nice. And, like, part of the reason, I think, like, while we're having the discussion, like we've said, is that a lot of the stuff is not really known to the public. And it's something that I say to a, whenever I have discussions about, like, mobile games or free-to-play design, I always say that so many people look at this stuff as stupid. You know, you'll see, like, influencers say, why is so-and-so put loot boxes? You know, these developers are idiots. They're fools, whatever. And I always come back with, what this stuff is, this is not stupid. This is very targeted, very intelligent designs that are used to manipulate people. And if you come at this from, you know, the joking side that, you know, they're just doing it because they're idiots, they don't know what they're talking about, it really, I think, deludes this kind of, this kind of talk and why it's so important. Yeah, I don't know if I'd completely agree with the it being intelligent. <laughs> uh, I, I certainly wouldn't describe it as scientific. Okay. Uh, that's something I've really push, been pushing for for decades now, is applying science to game development. And, <laughs> and yes, those are maybe like psychological tricks they're using or engineering methods, but they're not based on science. Or if they are, like in the case of like loot boxes and stuff, they're based on uh, neuroscience work that was done by Dr. Skinner back in 1930. And so uh, you've got non-neuroscientists applying almost 100-year-old neuroscience um, in ways they don't understand. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's why they don't work. If it's applied correctly, um, as, as, as challenging as the idea of science being used to improve how much your brain likes something if it's applied correctly uh consumers enjoy it and they pay for it mm -hmm. yep and what we've seen again is like just how far you know developers have really gone with these elements i mean i remember like early 2010 maybe a little bit sooner than that like we started to see developers use loot boxes as a form of an in-game reward, not a, a monetization reward. Um, Lost Planet 2 by Capcom did such that. And I remember people were like joking, you know, this slot machine is so weird, but I just love to keep doing it. You know, I love to keep rolling the slots and get some cool weapon or this cool loot. And what we saw was developers took that and said, okay, let's put a price tag on it. And this whole economy system was born and it's been like a part of so many of these games that it becomes so entangled in their designs that it becomes a lot harder as i'm sure you're well aware with the work you've done to kind of like untie those knots from the gameplay loop well i mean the idea of uh, these randomized intermittent rewards uh mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about which yeah. you can call them gambling, you can call them slot machines, you can call them loot boxes. It really doesn't matter to the human brain. They're all the same thing. They're all triggering the same systems that were described by Dr. Skinner in 1930 and 1931, which at some point was discovered by people in the game industry, and they thought this was a fantastic thing. The, the idea that you could uh, give a lab animal uh, a reward but not every time, and, and uh, uh, so they would never know quite when they would get it. Uh, they would just sit there and hit the lever, and basically until they dropped from exhaustion to get this reward. And, and the idea that gamers would keep banging on a button until they killed over from exhaustion was just like mana from heaven for some people in the gaming industry. Uh, personally, I don't think I want to harm uh, my consumers. And this is when I talked about, when I wrote about Force Wars, I specifically defined uh, dark siding or dark siding technologies as those where in order to make uh, a profit, 
uh, the developer is willing to sacrifice the health of the consumer. Yep. And it's on it's on the, it's on the table if you're a dark sider or you're using dark side technologies. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're using light side technology side technologies you go to extreme lengths to make sure you're doing no harm mm -hmm. and that's what makes us such a hard topic to discuss because the uh, dark side mechanics and these elements that we've discussed they work they work incredibly well you can pick any mobile free to, free to play game release in the last four to five years that uses them in some way shape or form and they make bank uh, Genshin Impact in 2019 made, I think, $60 million within its first week with, you know, its first very limited time gotcha system. And developers notice that. I mean, we've... And, and, they're, and they're especially effective on children. Oh, yes. The whole, um, I brought up in the article that I linked you about, like, Fear Missing Out with uh, Fortnite. They had, like, a limited time event with Ariana Grande. They have limited time Superman, uh, skins like all these are aimed to get people especially those hardcore fans to get them to spend money because if you miss it during that you know one week one month whatever it's gone and that is not a mechanic that is good for consumers it's really good to make money but it's not healthy for the consumer base i'm in agreement yeah <laughs> So uh, let's uh, bring this back and talk a little bit more about wargaming, since we certainly have a lot to get into on that front. So uh, where do you want to kind of start there? Well, uh, when I wrote Supremacy Goods, which was a, uh, a new microeconomic model to explain the behavior of, uh, of goods in virtual worlds, uh, I, initially, I kept the paper secret, and I I showed it to I offered to show it to Riot and Wargaming in 2011, I believe, and uh, Riot refused to talk to me, and uh, the vice president of marketing for Wargaming was willing to sit down with me on the floor in the middle of E3 and read this fairly long paper uh, while I watched him because I wouldn't let him have a copy of it. And he sat down and for two hours in the middle of E3. And if, if you've ever been to E3, mm. I mean, every minute is precious there. Your company spent a lot of money to, to set up a, a huge booth like they had. And he sat down for two hours and read this. And, uh, and then later kept asking me for copies. But I ultimately ended up publishing it on Gama Sutra, one of the first papers I ever published on Gama Sutra. And, and probably the longest paper they've ever allowed to be published on Gama Sutra. Um, and uh, four weeks later, I was hired by uh, Microsoft. I was working, I was tasked with uh, finding some way to make uh, Project Spark into a viable game, because at the time it was just a technology. So I did that. The goal was never to like, make it be a huge success, but just to make it work. And we did that. And, uh, um, and, and, and with, like with all games, I was producing the metagame, which meant I could create the award systems, social systems, uh, progression systems, um, monetization, business model, game economies, all that stuff. But I don't usually like gameplay isn't my thing. Uh, you know, there's other people who are much better at making gameplay than I am. Uh, so uh, um, that went pretty well. And near the very end of that cycle, I, I ended up getting sniped by Wargaming. They were like, oh, you know, when they... When I told them I, you know, I'd love to work with them, they they moved quickly to to snatch me from Microsoft, and um, but because it was such a high level hire, I had to go to Belarus and and, and uh, be interviewed by by some of the founders of Wargaming, and this actually took place on the same day as I think it was the fifteenth anniversary celebration, which was this humongous party with thousands of people in attendance at uh in belarus and minsk so i found myself in a bunker underground um in minsk belarus behind the iron curtain and there was only six people in the room um one of them interestingly enough was chris taylor and so he ends up being weaved a little bit into this tale um chris taylor was the founder of gas-powered games mm -hmm. He's made some of my favorite games of all time. 
so I really uh, look up to him, and I was very excited just to be in the same room with him. Um, and and he went first, and basically what I observed was them saying that they were going to produce, fund his studio um, and his super project. He was creating a massive open world and uh, a, just a mind-blowing project. And if you know Chris Taylor, he likes to make things big. Mm-hmm. So you can just imagine what he was working on. Um, but they, the, so they agreed to back him. Uh, Gas Power Games became, um, I think it was then called uh, Wargaming Seattle. And, uh, and I'll get back to how him and I intersected in a bit. Um, I had a, uh, uh, oh, the interview. I had one of the, the strangest interviews ever. Uh, after Chris left, and it was just five people in the room, one of which would be my future boss, and two of the people were, were founders. Um, they basically got in my face and yelled at me for an hour straight. I mean, I, I, I really couldn't even get a word in. And they're, they're, English was their second language. Uh, um, so I was really kind of afraid to say the wrong thing and have them misinterpret anything I said. But after like an hour, my face was literally wet with saliva <laughs> after an hour. This is how intense they wanted to get across their, their intentions to me. Um, uh, finally, when they both stopped to breathe at the same time, I, I figured the only way this was going to work was uh, I grabbed a Sharpie, ran over to the whiteboard, and filled the whole whiteboard with mathematical formulas showing how they could optimize World of Tanks uh, in like three to five minutes. I just went berserk on this whiteboard. And they looked at each other. They looked at my future boss and nodded him, maybe said something really fast in Russian. And then they both walked out of the room. <laughs> and I was like, I just I said to my future boss, I said, what just happened? And he said, uh, you're in. Welcome to Wargaming. And I was like, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, I thought for sure I wasn't going to get the job there the way this, that was going. Um, the reason I even bring that up uh, was because you know, the reason they were upset with me without even knowing me was they thought I was going to be like every, all the other people who said they did what I did in the industry at the time and probably almost all of them up to this point still, that they, they thought I was just going to fill their games with microtransactions <laughs> and pay-to-win systems and tricks to get people to spend more money. Uh, they really had a very low opinion of people like that. And so I, I, I had to explain to them that I'd spent the last, I don't know, by then, eight years developing methods for player-friendly business models and monetization systems um, and that I was actually very much on their side wanting to, to make um, games by gamers for gamers with the gamers best interest in mind. Um, that was really hard to explain to people back then. Uh, but they, they hired me and uh, and Oh, and they also, they also knew that I had been invited by uh, the ICPN, the International Consumer Protection Enforcement Network, uh, the world body for regulation of things like computer games. Uh, they knew that I had been the, the one independent um, gaming expert that had been invited to advise them during their, their summit uh, in Panama, where the UK Office of Fair Trade was going to propose a global system to regulate uh, access to online games for children. Mm-hmm. This is 2013. Um, and for anybody, this might have been a, a career ending thing to go out there and, and try to explain what the game industry should stop doing to regulators. Because I was kind of like, I don't know, you might say I was you know, betraying the industry by giving up secrets to regulators. But the way I saw it is my allegiance was first and foremost to the consumer, not to the game developers. And if game developers wanted to make money, but they wanted to do it the right way, then they'd, they'd employ me anyways, despite the fact that I helped regulators. 
But but uh, amazing enough, Wargaming in 2013 agreed to to not only let me go, but to fully fund the trip. Hmm. And and I, I just can't imagine any Western any other Western AAA company doing that in 2013. Yeah. And I couldn't imagine, you know, what we hear about wargaming now with them being so against loot boxes and microtransactions back in 2013. Well, see, what I'm trying to explain is, and, 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 and I, I still am extremely pro wargaming. I consider the company to be family. Uh, I, uh, I am absolutely loyal to wargaming. The, the reason I, I'm explaining these things is because it's important to know that the culture was absolutely pro-consumer in 2013, 2014, when I was there. Uh, and, I, and I wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for that. So, and, and I think the, uh, if you look at the earlier views for these games that I meta designed, the World well, of Tank Splits and World well, of the Warships, the, whatever complaints players had in like Steam reviews were primarily about gameplay initially because there was still a lot of balancing going on. Uh, um, you know, everything, gameplay is always a little rough when you first start. But, but people largely were very positive about the metagame or just didn't talk about the metagame because, and that's what I want. I want the business model to be invisible. You shouldn't have to step to the business model to play a game. You should just be able to play the game. Mm-hmm. And that's... But something... obviously that's changed. Yeah, of course. <laughs> And I was now just, the complaints are almost all about the metagame. Yeah. And like the recent reviews of World Warships right now is currently mixed on Steam. And I'm sure there's a lot more just like anger going on about that. And yeah, like the very first like negative reviews are, you know, they're selling out. There's loot, you know, it's hard to play because of these monetizations. And it, it's one of those things, again, that... There, there's definitely that discussion. I know we've been talking about this on for our, one of our game dev roundtables about just how much, you know, company culture can shift and change and what that actually means. It's very similar or in some sense to what kind of like the whole Blizzard fallout and how, you know, the Blizzard of the 90s is not the same Blizzard as it is today. And it's something I think a lot of consumers don't quite necessarily grasp that, you know, they think they see a name like... You know, Blizzard, like Wargaming, uh, Overkill, whatever. And they think that that name, you know, is fixed. You know, if you're a good studio at the beginning, you're a good studio now. But so much about how these companies can shift and change that some, you know, the company that you knew five years ago is probably not the same as it is today. Um, I know there's a lot of knowledge about kind of like what happened with Maxis and, you know, how they really change and. You know, I think they eventually went out or they're like nowhere near where they were 15, 20 years ago. Well, I mean, you know, turnover in industry is extremely high. Yep. Uh, much higher than, than any, any than the average industry or the average of other industries. Um, and and even if a, a company starts with one ideology and, and, and mm-hmm. one brand that, they're, that they guard, uh, you know, uh, great. I mean, Blizzard. And even Electronic Arts, Electronic Arts was when it, in the '80s was like my favorite favorite game company. When they put something out, I'd be rushing to see what it was. Um, you know, things changed at EA, and of course, uh, my excitement over their more recent products has been not like it was back in the '80s. Uh, but you know, people come and people go, and mm-hmm. uh, new people bring new ideology, and even though the brand may be the same. They, they will change the ideology sometimes in ways that are counter to the brand. Uh, mm-hmm. And they'll have to spend increasing amounts of PR to try to convince you that they're still on brand, even though they're not. Yep. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, Chris Taylor, or uh, where do you want to go from here? Um, I, I, I have so much to talk about that I kind of made a little list of things that go <laughs> down. So uh, um, Chris Taylor comes up more like at the end of 2014. Okay. And a lot happens between when I started and when that starts to happen. Uh, um, uh, do you want me to talk about ACPN? What happened there? Sure. Because you alluded to it earlier. 
Mm-hmm. But that's when I, I, I went up and, and showed slides of um, the most dangerous product for children I could find in the market. Um, and uh, at that time, it was a, a Disney Marvel product uh, made by Gazillion. And, uh, um, and then Disney, and the only other person to speak at the conference was the vice president of Disney. And she, and she showed what she, what I think it was Club Penguin, Penguin, which they decided, thought was like their most consumer friendly product. And I showed them this other product. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had warned her that I was going to talk about one of their products, but I don't think she took me seriously at all. And uh, um, what I said very much contradicted what she said. And so uh, when she was done, the senior German regular stood up and started asking her some very good questions, but some very un- uncomfortable questions for her. And mm-hmm. um, being the sophisticated vice president for a very large company that she was, she knew the smartest thing for her to do in that situation was to say nothing. <laughs> and so she threw her translator down and ran as fast as this, uh, you know, uh, you know, a little bit older lady could get out of the out of of the of this huge conference room. And as far as I know, she left Panama. <laughs> um, and and everybody was just watching her with their mouths open. They just couldn't believe what they were saying. So if they, if um, you know, if if all the regulators in attendance didn't believe what I my presentation before, they certainly did after they saw that display. <laughs> Uh, and I warned them that, that, that about the, the existing problems in 2013, and I warned them that things were going to get much worse m- much sooner because there were new technologies that were going to be arriving uh, soon that, mm-hmm. that meant that they, are, they were always going to be years behind this, this race and that they really needed to do their best to be proactive. Yep, and I mean, when, <clears throat> excuse me, I think one of our more recent casts, I think this was like late 2019, maybe early 2020, we were talking about the whole loot box law that the United States was kind of working with at that time. And of course, this was pre-COVID, and that kind of shut down all that discussion. But we're starting to hear like those rumblings again about trying to introduce legislation to curb these elements. And... It was something that we warned or that you warned when we did that cast that if that went in, you know, unchanged, that bill would have just completely decimated the entire mobile free to play industry overnight. Yeah. Well, because uh, almost everybody's put their eggs in that basket. Mm-hmm. Uh, interestingly enough, at the ICPN conference, there were some notable pe- groups that weren't present. Uh, Apple was invited, they did not, they did not accept mm-hmm. the invitation. Uh, Google was invited. They did not accept the invitation. Um, uh, the United States regulators were absent, uh, which tells you something. I mean, uh, uh, this is such an important conference, but the United States didn't want to attend this time uh, because a, a great number of the industries that they were seeking to regulate were American industries. So. I think they were just hoping the whole thing would just go away if they didn't participate. Uh, China was not present. Again, a, a, a huge producer of computer games. Uh, so basically, everyone who really should have been there wasn't there except for Disney. And that went so, that did not go well for Disney. So they, were, they probably would have been smart just to not show up also. But I think the, the, the idea with the regulators is just ignore them. You hope they go away. Uh, and until you get to the point where, like, California starts going down the list and suing major game developers. That's, mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the end game you just absolutely want to avoid. But if you just stall long enough, it ends up going to that. Yep, and... Uh, the whole, you know, Activision Blizzard lawsuit that is still, you know, we saw like no like update information as of right now. We're we're recording this end of August, and I'm sure there's still a lot more that's going to come from that. And you know, whether or not Blizzard survives, you know, in any capacity, is still very much up in the air. Well, they're still investigating. They're still interviewing mm-hmm. people, and and it sounds like there's thousands of 
current and former employees yeah. that are quite happy to testify against their own company. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds like Riot is next on California's list. <laughs> yep, and they're not, this will not be the first time, right? It has had several right. uh, harassment lawsuits like levied at them in the last few years. But those were civil complaints, so they can just sign the paper and then just go about business as usual. Mm-hmm. You know, just pay off their employees and, and not necessarily make the changes they need to make. Right. It's different when you get your, when, the, when the state of California goes after you. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. And I think to bring this back to wargaming, again, like talking about how things have shifted, like, as we were talking, I looked up the forum of World Warships on Steam just to see what people are saying. And they have it, of course, like, all the complaints and all the discussions aren't on their, like, general thread. It's on the feedback and suggestions. And... Mm. One thing that I just find very disheartening that somebody who's a supporter of wargaming said is that they basically said, like, wargaming is just out to get your money. You know, like, this is normal for them, you know. Like, all these complaints are, and the person said the analogy of, this is like walking into a casino and complaining that you lost your money. And that just sounds, again, like the complete opposite of how you describe wargaming back in 2013, 2014. They they fully paid for me to go mm-hmm. to the ICPN summit and assist regulators in regulating industry globally to protect children. Uh, this they were really in my mind's eye, wargaming was really the champions of gamers' rights during that era, and they were uh, they were the superheroes of the industry and the. Gamers rewarded them. They went from they went from forty employees to four thousand employees in two years. Uh, it, their their rise was meteoric. They were they they uh, they were just blowing everyone away. And they had the they had possibly the biggest E three uh, displays at the time. I mean, they were war gaming was huge. Yeah, because they were doing it right. Yeah. Blizzard the same way. I mean, Blizzard rose to prominence in the 90s and early 2000s by being that studio that was held as, like, the gold standard of design. StarCraft basically defined esports and became a natural pastime in South Korea. World of uh, Warcraft, I mean, I can't even imagine how much money that game has earned over the last, what, we like, 16 years now. Or even more, I, I completely forgot. It seems like like the before times of that game. I mean, when people talk about like major companies like that, you know, they usually put Nintendo, Valve, and Blizzard, and that kind of you know, when these companies say something, everybody stops and listens because they're the the ones who've earned that right. And again, like, I'm not sure this you know how the mighty has fallen, but it's just that. You know how things can just really go downhill if you're not careful. Well, I'm going to explain to you how things fell. Yeah, because it didn't just happen. It just, they didn't just wake up one day and let's say let's let's start dark siding our our yep. players. Uh, it, 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 it's it was a process that took years and some bad choices. Um, okay, so uh, when I was hired at Work Gaming, I was like the second employee sent to the brand new Austin think tank uh, in Texas. And, uh, and this, was, uh, uh, this facility was built specifically to hire experts, like the top experts in the world, and then to distribute their knowledge across all of our studios, because we had studios on at least three continents. Uh, you know, it, was, it was just almost overnight this became a, a huge company. Um, and for the first two or three months, uh, well, for a couple months after I got back from the ICPN summit, uh, um, they weren't really sure what to do with me. Uh, I think they really weren't sure whether they were going to trust me. Because, I mean, what I do is uh, absolutely fundamental to the success or failure to, of a game. So if they trusted me and, and it wasn't going to work, um, you know, I could just wreck the company. Yeah. So, uh, three months after I'm hired, I end up being uh, uh, sent with a couple of my teammates to 
a hotel room in Los Angeles where one of the founders that had interviewed me that was actually the original designer of World of Tanks was in bed and, and apparently he was ill. And I wouldn't realize how, uh, how ill until later. But apparently he was very concerned that he wouldn't make it. Um, and there's also another man that uh, had been described to me as, um, as having been hired because he was the friend of a very powerful person in the company. Uh, possibly the most powerful person in the company. And, wh- and he, this person was his drinking buddy. But he was describing himself as like the ultimate super fan. And because of that, he knew exactly what needed to be done with the company and with the company's products. But he had no previous game development experience whatsoever. And he was in this room also. And I was trying to explain what things we could do to improve our products. And, uh, and this person was trying to shoot down what I was saying and was coming up with some really bizarre ideas. Um, I, at some point I just had to stop and I knew I had permission from my boss to do this because he wanted me to do it. He didn't want to do it himself because of the peril. Uh, I basically called this guy out as a charlatan right in front of the founder. Um, and that's in, in Russian culture, that's a very provocative thing to do. Uh, and I was sure that I would be fired by the end of the week after I did that. But I just had to do it. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not neurotypical. Um, I've got no filter. So it's very hard for me to keep my mouth shut in a situation like that. Um, so you know, I'm walking back to the elevator by myself thinking, well, I guess it's start time to start putting out those, those resumes. And, uh, uh, um, and, and, and suddenly this, this bedridden founder forces his way into the elevator just as it's closing. I'm like, how did he even get down the hallway? I mean, he would have had to run to catch me. And, uh, and so we're like all alone in the elevator again, which just seems to be like a, a theme, you know, <laughs> in Russian culture. Um, and, and he's like, would you be willing to go to Belarus again? And I'm like, I just said, I will go anywhere you want me to at any time which I guess was the right answer. And the next thing I know, I'm in Belarus in the middle of the Russian winter. And um, uh, in the very first meeting, I was told that I was going to have total authority over the production of World of Saints Blitz, which was Wargaming's first mobile game. Uh, my mouth dropped open because I went from like zero to now I'm in charge of everything. And I, and I had never been in charge of a whole project. I mean, I had done the design, but I've never had to, like, be the person that had to make the call on everything. And I even had authority to delay the project if I thought it was necessary for the success of the game. Um, I ended up choosing not to delay World of Tank Splits. I thought, we can do this. And I thought, even if it ends up being a B game, uh, for our first mobile game, I thought B would be pretty good. And I thought then we could take the data we got, you know, be early into the market when mobile games are really getting hot, and then use that to build a series of A-level mobile games afterwards, using the data and the infrastructure and all the, the skills we had built in the process. And uh, Blitz ended up uh, coming out very quickly. I designed the metagame for that um, in 11 weeks. And it can't hit the market, and it ended up being a huge hit. And it's still going. Uh, I designed that at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Still going strong. So that was a real success. Um, and, and then I would end up starting to, to develop our sec- to start designs, uh, design work on our second generation mobile games. Um, coming off the success of Blitz, I didn't freeze to death or anything, but it was really cold out there. Um, I got sent back to St. Petersburg to assist the Lesta studio, which was working on World of Warships. And um, same founder had put me up in his own apartment when I was in Minsk. He did the same thing. He got me, he, he gave his apartment up for me in St. Petersburg. So I was really feeling like, you know, I was family. I was feeling like, you know, I would do anything for the company. And I, I did. Um, and in, 
in 14 weeks, uh, I completed the design for the metagame for World of Warships. It, it, I had to do, I, I wasn't able to remove gold ammo from Blitz. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, but since they had to give me access to the core numbers for World of Tanks to build Blitz, um, I ended up starting to do repairs on the original numbers on World of Tanks also. So World of Tanks was improved during that time. I, even though I couldn't get gold ammo removed from World of Tanks Blitz, I, um, I wrote up the complex schematics to basically, they could just input an Excel spreadsheet and hit a button and gold, gold ammo would have disappeared from World of Tanks and World of Tanks Blitz. Mm -hmm. They chose not to do that. But after months, I mean, most of the time I spent uh, uh, in, in St. Petersburg, the most important thing was to get gold ammo removed from World of Warships. And I was successful. And I think, I mean, I, I, I've never surveyed the, the players, but I think they would all agree that that was a huge step forward, uh, making the game more fair and making the game more fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I got there, they wanted to do the same thing they did with World of Tanks, where um, they wanted all the tanks to be equal. Uh, and so in here, they wanted a destroyer to be just as powerful as a cruiser, to be just as powerful as a battleship, to be just as powerful as an aircraft carrier. And I said, that's just not going to feel right. I don't think that's going to be fun. Uh, but they said, well, the how, there's no other way to do that. So I had to um, show them that I had models for uh, asymmetrical warfare and asymmetrical matchmaking that would make this all possible. And I was able to convince them to do it. And I, I don't want to go into details because that's, those are still like top secret stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, it all worked. Uh, and, and, it, and it was fun. Uh, even though you've got big ships playing with small ships. And uh, um, that, that didn't seem like a good way, to, easy way to balance that at first. <laughs> uh, I, I actually took the, some of the models that I had there. I had originally developed for a game called End of Nations which was supposed to be like the sequel to a game I worked on back in 2000, 2001 with Nexon called Shattered Galaxy. And having looked at uh, having uh, taken all the knowledge I gained working on Shattered Galaxy, I knew what needed to be done for End of Nations, or at least I thought it did, and I knew there were some very major design hurdles, those problems in End of Nations. Um, Try and Worlds refused to talk to me um, again. Uh, and even though the community was really pushing hard to get me on the project because they knew I worked uh, so hard on Shattered Galaxy. Um, and then uh, they ended up not being able to make End of Nations. They, after a few years, they just gave up on the project, um, which I think is unfortunate. But I'm, I suspect they ran into these design problems and didn't know what to do. And, and refuse to talk to me for whatever reason. Yeah. So, and that's part of why I was able to do that so fast in just 14 weeks in St. Petersburg, because I already had solved these problems before for End of Nations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so i got to look at my list here, because there's <laughs> so, much, so much to talk about. Oh, if you have a question, go ahead. And what I was going to say is, so... Like with like the work you did on uh, World Blitz that and also part on World Tanks was kind of trying to like remove or get rid of those uh, dark side mechanics. Like again, like we said with developers, I I think we had this discussion on previous casts. Like when like a developer comes up to you and says like we want our games to make money. We want obviously if a game doesn't make money it's not going to survive. That's just the nature of the beast. And if someone like says to you, you know, why should we use these light side mechanics if they don't work as well as they're not as prevalent as the dark side? It's like, what would you say to them on that? I would say that if you played Civ or any game that involves technology, uh, you know that, when you start on a technological path, you start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And over time, you develop. And the longer you spend working on a technology, the better it gets. I would say that light sider technologies are far superior to dark sider technologies, but the fact that we haven't invested in developing them or applying them, I mean, 
not my designs to use them, but but uh, it, it, they're still at their infancy. So yes, a very well advanced dark side technology is is easier to deploy, more reliable, uh, possibly even more effective in the short term. Uh, but that's only because so much more work has been gone into iterating those technologies that they're that they've gotten very cheap, very reliable, very effective. But life saver technologies, there's there's I'm gonna get into this, but there's 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 an end game where you just can't take go any further with dark side technologies and and and, and consumers start to get used to they start to un- understand what you're doing to them. Mm-hmm. And they become very quick to react. It's like an immune system. The immune system response gets stronger and faster the more they're exposed to it. And pretty soon, these these techniques don't work on them anymore. And then your whole business model fails. And what mm-hmm. do you do? You've invested everything going into dark side tech, and now you have no options. Mm-hmm. And this is also, I think, why a lot of these companies are very quick to you know stamp out any controversies any dissent like we saw with the whole the first example with wargaming when they went after the uh, youtuber or talking mm-hmm. about one of their pay to win tanks and mm-hmm. i've heard like horror stories from like youtubers who become big enough that they get like first access rights or they become like ambassadors to mobile and free-to-play games and what happens if they have a problem or they want to talk about something that the companies doing that they're not supportive of? Like these companies will strike back hard at them. I mean, you know this firsthand because you've been in journals for a long time. I started in journalism in 2001. Uh, you know, I, I, I would get, if I put out a negative review, <clears throat> I wouldn't get access to <clears throat> any more beta tests. So, I mean, uh, there's tremendous pressure on journalists to, uh, sugarcoat and give mm-hmm. good reviews uh, because if you get bad reviews you stop getting invites um, I, I, I'm, I'm really bad at lying and maybe that's <laughs> because I'm not neurotypical uh, and, but at least I developed that reputation where people would read my stuff and, and, and it builds a lot of trust between me and my readers back in the old days when I was doing gaming journalism and now more recently since but 2012, since I've been writing on Gama Sutra and other places, um, you know, people will challenge what I write, which they should. I see it as like a, you know, a peer review. And then uh, at the end, if it survives peer review, then what I write is generally a, a trustworthy document. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think uh, most people are in that position. They, you know, uh, if, you, if you're completely dependent on the developer, on, on your relationship with the developer, and the developer strikes you, then you're screwed. They can put you out of business. Yep. Right. And That's mean, tremendous pressure to 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 gloss the things over and 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 say what the developer wants you to say. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, we've seen a lot of those stories as well from developers who, or I'm sorry, people on the journalistic side who get blacklisted. Who can't cover a certain game anymore because they gave it a negative review, whatever. And yeah, like it's why I've always like say that I feel like game journalism and the game industry itself are very much like two separate universes. It's why like I don't consider myself really a game journalist these days because I don't care about you know the journalistic side. I care more about the academ- academic side, talking to people who actually make games. And you know these topics aren't you know they're not buzzworthy. They're not you know what's going to be on the front page of Reddit or IGN or whatever. But I think it's more important to have these conversations. Well, I mean, uh, you know, our target audience isn't as as much the the gamer uh, like the mm-hmm. typical YouTube streamer. It's more the developers. Yep. Uh, you know, we're we're talking about game development, yep. so uh, it's 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 different, and uh, it's a different audience, and 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 because of that maybe we have a little bit more, more insulation because we're not dependent on early access to a game for our survival. <laughs> Definitely not. So with me, at the rate that I go with games, it takes me like usually like three to five months after a game's release to finally get a chance to go through it, let alone you know. Yeah. 
be like the very first one like i just completely got out of that chase like i tried it like one time i was like no i don't want to be you know day one playing these games because it doesn't really give me a chance to look at them and even my audience doesn't really seem to respond when i play a game for day one views because day one views don't really mean much in the grand scheme of things well i mean just between 2012 and 2013 i was helping four five six different triple a companies there were very few triple a companies in the west that i wasn't working with except for those that just absolutely would not talk to me which i think was for non-professional reasons Mm -hmm. um but uh which i seem to run into a lot um but i mean you know when you have a name like ruby and shelf reside it's just par for the course um but uh after the icpn uh, you know summit after i uh you know inadvertently ended up shaming disney um uh i haven't worked with the triple western triple a company since then that was it it all dried up and i and i absolutely knew that going in i absolutely knew that i was risking my career uh mm-hmm. to go there uh, and that's probably why I was the only one that went. Um, but I'm, you know, I continue to do well uh, working with non-Western companies, and uh, um, and my research and my technologies keep advancing to the point where they're like now they're like the realm of science fiction. Anyway, so we, I want to get back on topic because we've got so much stuff yeah. to go over here. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. Um, uh, okay, the, Ukra- the Ukrainian Civil War. This mm-hmm. is where things really start to change. Uh, and, and this is, you know, I, I, I like to think that I can predict things before they happen to some extent. But, but I wasn't expecting, you know, the Ukrainian Civil War and how this was going to change the company so much. Um, you know, just like in America, there was a, lo- a strong sense of nationalism in, in Russia. And when the Ukrainian Civil War started and the West started applying sanctions to Russia, uh, this had a, uh, you know, Russians have a tough life already. And, I, you know, and, 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 and no one had a harder war, too, than, 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 the, than Eastern Europe, where, the, you know, 35 million ethnically Russian people died fighting the, the Nazis. And, and, and Belarus took the absolute brunt of it because they were the first country on the road to Moscow. And uh, 90% of the men aged 13 and older were killed during the years that the Germans occupied Belarus. Now, I learned this, you know, going to the, the war museums in Belarus, which they're, they're really proud of because they, they really, you know, want to remember what happened. And, and, and this had a huge effect on their culture. The men were just wiped out. Um, you know, and, and so when, when things got tough during the Ukrainian Civil War, uh, the sense of Russian pride started to emerge again. And while there's nothing wrong with that, uh, part of that was a, a strong anti-American sentiment. And this created a lot of tensions with uh, the, um, the Austin think tank. And, 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 and also uh, our revenues are impacted. So um, there was pressure to start cutting back on all these Americans. And, and Americans were more and more not allowed to go to, to Belarus or to Russia. And most of my coworkers are, were starting to get fired like right after they'd come back from Russia. I, I was wasn't and it was generally accepted that i was a protected employee because i was very close to some founders and um i i I was working at uh, near the end there i was working on seven different games uh on three different continents and and uh and so there was there'd be no way to 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 eliminate me as an employee without doing catastrophic damage to the company Everyone knew this that that I worked with. So, but but my budget ended up getting blocked. 
meaning that I could no longer go to Eastern Europe. I, my travel budget got locked by somebody I didn't, I didn't even work with, a founder that, that I didn't work with. And I, and I believe this all was happening because um, this person that I challenged in that hotel room right before the moment in the, in the elevator, uh, I'm just going to call him the catfish. Mm-hmm. Uh, the catfish, who is obviously Russian fluent, he's from Eastern Europe, I think he went back and began a gaslighting campaign because he wanted to he wanted to get me out of the company as fast as possible. He was having trouble because I was having so much success. So I was protected by one founder, so he had to find another founder that he could convince um, that I was a bad American. And that took him a while. Um, uh, but still some other things happened. After my budget was locked, I was still able to go to Seattle to help Chris Taylor. And Chris Taylor's project was mind-blowing. And I created a really complex uh, um, metagame model that would uh, allow for fair play uh, and quick, fast battles, uh, but also long-term play and long-term progression. So that people would play the game for years. Um, uh, after I completed the meta game design, or at least the early stages of it, the, the project got greenlighted with my meta design. And then something happened. Um, the project got put on hold and then canceled. Um, Chris Taylor was told to start working on a project that was mediocre and had little chance of being successful, at least in the West. Um, the catfish uh, moved to Seattle and put himself in that studio as their metagame designer. And then the catfish uh, changed his LinkedIn profile and basically copy-pasted my LinkedIn profile, which is very unusual LinkedIn profile. Um, and put it on his LinkedIn profile. He, he was, this was like, I don't know, what was that movie? A uh, single white female or something like that, where, where the, the one person, you know, that's the, she, her roommate ends up stalking her and <laughs> trying to become her, changing her hair and everything like that. This guy tried to become me and was convincing everybody that they didn't need me because he was me. It was, Weird. It was really weird. And, 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 and I don't know if, 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 you know, if Chris Taylor took part of the brunt of this, uh, you know, or if that would happen no matter what. But uh, I don't know how, long, how he managed to put up with it as long as he did. You know, it, my understanding is that they've been promised to, to, to bring his game to market. And instead, they just end up canceling it. Um, and I think he ended up leaving the company soon after I did and um, uh, and they had to give up his own studio mm. and uh, you know, he had told me that that would you know that that he had control that they could never take a studio from him well they did mm. and uh, and and now he doesn't I can't even talk to him about gaming anymore he's just it's just too, too stressful for him uh, it's very frustrating for me because I I uh, I have so I hold him in such high esteem as a game developer and a game designer. Uh, I want to see him back in the game. Um, so, okay. And so the next thing that happens is I'm, I'm back in the, I'm back in this, the, in Austin and the catfish comes to the Austin studio and he wants to meet with me in private. And he tells me, that um, he's going to make me a deal. The deal is that I'm going to continue to write design documents for Wargaming, but I'm only going to give these design documents to him. And then he's going to go ahead and take credit for those design documents. Hmm. And if I agree, then I will get to keep my job. <laughs> yes. um, but then um, I will just basically disappear, and he'll just be writing stuff for him. Uh, didn't want to interrupt, but apparently my camera is frozen on OBS. Give me one 
second. I think something got bugged out. Uh, let's see. I think it's just the window itself. Let me uh, try this again. I may just have to recreate it. Um, while I'm doing this, um, yeah, and it's like one of those things that sounds like out like of a <laughs> of a bad movie, really. Yeah, truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. <laughs> so odd. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I had I had an American boss who was there in that original meeting. You know, and that was the head of, of that of that studio. And and I had uh, I had a Russian boss who was the founder and original designer of World of Tanks. And uh, my response to this guy was, um, I wrote up. Uh, he, he wanted me to first start with writing a, a, a document that would solve all the major problems in World of Tanks. Mm -hmm. So I did what he said, but, but, but I didn't do the other part of what he said, which was did not tell anyone. So I wrote up the document he asked for, and, uh, you know, and I, I sent it to him, and I CC'd it to my two bosses, my Russian boss and my American boss. And I did it so that he'd see that I CC'd it. I was basically telling him to go bleep himself, um, and I and I thought I thought that he couldn't fire me, um, but uh, a few weeks later I was I was gone from from wargaming. Uh, I had just given a one hour uh, presentation on uh, the progress of my design of a mobile game in the Master of Orion IP uh, to a crowded room. And then a few minutes later, uh, they grabbed my laptop and told me I was being laid off because I wasn't working on any projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was part of budget cuts. But I was working on seven projects at the time. I, I, maybe whoever they, the, whoever they convinced to, to can me probably didn't even know what I was working on. Hmm. So, um, I think soon after that, Chris Taylor left, and uh, and all of those seven projects with the well, uh, World of Tanks Blitz and World of Warships were far enough along that they were basically design complete, and they went to market and were very successful. Hmm. The other projects all got canceled hmm. because there was no way to continue them without design. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it, imagine, during their heyday, uh, Wargaming had seven projects, uh, maybe more, but just the ones I, that, I, that I was working on was seven, uh, on three continents, all being worked on in parallel. Since then, to my knowledge, they've only had one game come out, and this was since 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been... Six years and nothing. And the only one game product that they put out that I knew of was someone said, well, we can take the design documents from World of Warships and World of Tanks Blitz that Ermin wrote up and we'll Frankenstein monster them together and we'll make World of Warships Blitz. Now, if you've never heard of World of Warships Blitz, I don't blame you. <laughs> but obviously, what they thought was, oh, the, what could go wrong? We'll put these together and we can do this. Well, apparently... Even that wasn't was a little bit more complicated than they had hoped it would be, and that game did not turn out well at all. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard of them working on anything else, so uh, which is which is uh, what everybody at War Gaming uh, Austin expected when I left was that all these projects would be canceled and that would be it. Mm -hmm. And you know. <laughs> the story doesn't end there, unfortunately. But but yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, like the whole thing with uh, Chris Taylor, like that is definitely horrible to hear. And like one of the reasons why um, I wanted to do this cast with you because I like, guess somebody who talks about game design and talks to developers, I don't like to hear stories about you know this kind of stuff happening to someone, especially you know a name as prominent as Chris Taylor. You, you mentioned, of course, earlier, like. Some of the, his games he's worked on, uh, Supreme Commander, Total Annihilation. I know he was brought on to do uh, Age of Empires Online. This was like 20... Dungeon, the Dungeon Siege oh, yeah. games were fantastic. Yeah, I enjoyed the first one. And 
I know he was trying to do a Kickstarter for, I think it was like a prehistoric game. This was, I think, 2016, 2017, something like that. Oh. I didn't go through. And yeah, like, I've been one of those who wondering, like, what's happened to him? Because a lot of people, and like, this again goes back to, like, the idea of, like, company culture and stuff, that most people don't know the names behind these studios. Unless, of course, you know, you are Sid Meier or Hio Kojima or so on. And, or Chris Taylor. <laughs> yeah, or Chris Taylor. And it is horrible, like, when these things happen, they just kind of get swept under the rug. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, and I, I, I don't like to see any of these great designers, you know, um, you know, go off into the sunset. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, with, you know, technology has changed so much that sometimes they need help from newer people to, to stay relevant. And, and, but that's possible to do. And I, and I love working with the old, with the old great designers because they, they, they're the creatives, which is sorely lacking as we go further down in technology. With it, mm-hmm. oftentimes we're willing to sacrifice the creatives for the technology, and I, I don't think uh, we can afford to do that. Yeah, and I mean, like that is like we're going to describe a lot of what's happened with major companies, and again, we talked earlier with the high turnover and churn rates of these studios that. People, like, you release a successful game and then half the developers just, like, leave because they don't want to deal with this again for a second game. I mean, uh, Naughty Dog is up on the list for a lot of people as another studio that has those problems. Yeah, so uh, a year after I left, um, Catfish gets fired. Mm -hmm. And things must have been pretty bad for them to fire Catfish because... I mean, he was very well connected in the company. Um, uh, and then apparently, uh, to start to deal with all the, the to, to do the metagame work that needed to be done, a bunch of people from Machine Zone were hired and brought in. And I'm not going to get into Machine Zone's reputation. Uh, it would just take too long. But Machine Zone is very much like on the vanguard of the Dark Side attacks. I mean, they're so good at it; it's scary. Mm. Um, and and they were quite successful at it for a time, also. That's why they were able to hire Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mariah Carey and do Super Bowl commercials and such because it worked for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when it started to not work for them, apparently these people started jumping ship into wargaming, and so. Uh, when I when I heard to the grapevine that Catfish was gone, I asked if they wanted me back uh, because I knew I was still really popular with the company. But I had to go through these people from Machine Zone, and and uh, it, you know, it was very clear to everyone that ideologically we were that we couldn't be more opposites. And so, even though it may have been good for the company, uh, these people told me wargaming doesn't need a guru. Uh, uh, you know, or a Jedi, or whatever they want to call me, you know, and so, uh, so I got blocked, and uh, and I wasn't, for all practical purposes, I wasn't. It was clear I wasn't going back to war gaming, so I gave up on that, on that idea. Um, and and this is where you could see that the company ideology started to shift because the people in charge of the ideology were basically from Machine Zone. Um, so now, when you when you start to complain about well, why is the what's happened to the culture at wargaming? Well, basically, you're 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 not uh, you're not dealing with wargaming anymore. You're dealing with Machine Zone, mm-hmm. and I don't know. Does Machine Zone even make games anymore? Um, I was trying to look them up after you said their name, and like their last credit, I think, was from like 2015. Uh, there you go. Oh, wait, 2017. They did the uh, Final Fantasy 15: A New Empire. So I think it was the mobile game for... Like, there's like five okay. or six different Final Fantasy mobile games, but it was whatever that specific one was. Okay. Well, this would have been 2017 when I was talking to Wargaming again. Mm-hmm. So the, the timeline is perfect. You can see that you know those people had to go somewhere. Yep. And this is where they went. So, 
if if it feels like you're playing increasingly playing a machine zone game, it's because you are. Okay. And because it's the people that make games, not companies. And like we said, a lot of these monetization tactics, like once they're like put into a game, all the mechanics and the gameplay loops have to bend towards these systems or they're not going to work. And I, I'm not sure we said on this cast, I know we've talked about it before, but if you want monetization to work, it has to be fairly integrated into the mechanics and systems. If they don't support each other, you end up either with a game that doesn't make any money because the monetization doesn't work, or doesn't make any money because people hate it because the monetization works too well, and they see those dark side elements. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 the gamers have changed over these years too. Um, hmm? you know the 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 way I see it is is you know it. it in games, we build new realities for players. And uh, if, if the ideology of the new reality matches the ideology of the gamer, then the gamer will adopt the, the, the new reality and, get, and maybe even get lost in it and, and prefer the new reality to the default reality. But as soon as they realize that the ideology is in conflict and that, the, and that the, the, their interests are not the interests of the developer, then, the, then over time, the, the, it starts to really frustrate the, the gamer, and they will reject the construct. And I talked a lot about this in... First, I wrote um, group monetization, I think in like 2013. I think before I even joined Wargaming, I wrote that paper, uh, where I started talking about persistent gaming collectives, where because by nature, interactive media involves interaction, uh, Unlike other consumer groups, gamers tend to think and act collectively. They form like, uh, and, and if allowed to, they can very rapidly form basically like a hive mind. So even though these, these, uh, these people who think they're smarter than gamers, maybe they are smarter than gamers individually. But when you start talking about the mm -hmm. hive mind, you're talking about a lot of minds. And some of these people are really smart. And, and so the hive mind itself is much smarter than these developers. Oh, yes. And, I... and, they, and they, they very quickly figure out what, they, what, what, it, what they're, they're doing. They start t educating each other on what they're doing. And, and you could also see it as like an immune system response. The, the, the response becomes stronger, faster. When, when, when a dark side... Uh, uh, is uh, techniques is deployed like what was happening with the Missouri in, mm -hmm. in working. The reaction was rapid, it was strong, and it was collective because these content providers just blasted that out across the, the, the internet and, uh, and players reacted. Uh, mm -hmm. You saw the same thing with Blizzard. Yep. Uh, uh, For Honor, if you remember from a few years ago, when they did a data mine and they realized that a free to play player would have to play daily for like three years to acquire like all the free content that was in that game. And yeah, like I'm just nodding my head in agreement. Like a lot, yeah. like when it comes to these kinds of systems, like gamers together are a lot more intelligent than I think developers, any publishers give them credit for. Uh, Battlefront. Mm -hmm. Uh, Battlefront 2 with their whole uh, monetization system, another big example of this. And mm -hmm. it's it's incredible when we like see like this kind of thing put together because when you have that collective fan base, like you said about how it invites gamers into these worlds and they become very very dependent, like they very much love these set places, they want to defend them. Um, I did I think 2020, like I did a piece about low stakes games and, you know, we all need, you know, that release, we all need that pressure valve to let go and how, especially with the whole pandemic, that a lot of people turn to video games, maybe not for the first time, but, you know, they really use that as an escape mechanism. And it was why games like uh, Animal Crossing and a lot of those like very, you know, 
sandbox kind of experiences really invited people in because they weren't getting that kind of interaction that you know the dopamine in real life at that point yeah and and, and you saw this huge backlash against uh what star wars battlefront 2 mm-hmm. i mean that was and that erased three billion dollars from e, uh, ea's valuation in just a couple of weeks it oh, was yes. catastrophic for them i mean and 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 i wrote a whole paper about this uh called it uh secrets of free-to-play force wars and, and in my force wars paper i talked about uh how um you know these persistent gaming collectives were getting large enough and sophisticated enough that i uh, that uh um you know, you'd get these you get these dark side ideologies which i which i defined in the paper i defined what a dark side ideology is or, or dark side culture is what dark side technologies are i defined what light side technologies are and dark mm-hmm. and light side technology and I, I explained it that almost the entire AAA industry at that point in that then 2017 was uh was either fully dark side or about to be fully dark side and that and that when you have i, I think most Rank and file game developers would rather be light side, or they just have no opinion. Yep. Uh, but a lot of the leadership people coming in are from other industries, which is a whole other story I don't want to get into uh, where they're coming from. But they're bringing dark side technologies in, and and when that happens, you get what I call a force war. And uh, gen- predictably, the force wars are won by the dark siders. Uh, they just have the, they have more support from company culture because companies tend to prefer make money those types of people. Yep. <laughs> right, right. They, I mean, they want to make lots of <laughs> they want to make all the money basically. And <laughs> I mean, it's 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 more complicated than that, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's absolutely so. Um, and and then you have a third group, which I call the rebellion. And, and, and really, the rebellion is the, is the evolution of these persistent game collectives where gamers have become, I mean, you know, in the Star Wars mythos, the Empire would just laugh at the rebellion because they had nothing. They had no organization. I mean, they, a few of them would become upstarts on a planet, and the Empire would just come in and just crush them, <laughs> you know, with all these fleets and stuff. And there's no way they could resist. But over time... The rebellion became more organized, more sophisticated, more intelligent, uh, built more support, and eventually the rebellion was able to go toe to toe with the empire. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're seeing now. the The gamers have become the rebellion, and uh, and the empire is is now being stopped cold. I mean, they're 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 actually. I mean, if you look at what's going on at Blizzard, or maybe at Riot, or even at EA, I, they're facing the possibility of extinction. Because at the end of the day, uh, they answer to the consumers. Yeah, and, and that's who pays their bills. Oh, yes. And like with like Blizzard's case, like a lot of people... Were like first starting uh, that uh, Bobby Kotick, whoever the uh, head of Gearbox is, like because of like all the stuff that's been levied against him, they were like, no, Blizzard couldn't be a part of this. You know, Blizzard's unclean. No, Blizzard's clean. You know, they're untainted. And then all the stories came out: the Cosby suite, the harassment, and suicide. And it, oh, the suicide was so tragic. Yeah. I mean, it was just any way you look at that, that, that was just so awful. Oh yeah, and and, and then you con- and then you contrast that with the Cosby scene, which, uh, I mean, the optics there are just again just couldn't yeah. be worse. And like there, there's a t- rant in my mind. Been thinking about why. Like when I hear this stuff, I just think like. How the hell could this have happened? Like, for me, like, this is just completely the antithesis of my personality and my behavior. And, like, I just, like, think, like, maybe, like, people like me are, like, the exceptions in these cases. That, you know, like, it's so prevalent in some of these studios that, you know, 
I just want to be like, if I ever do join a studio like that, I would be considered the odd man out because I don't want to deal with that kind of thing. Well, maybe there's a reason why you do what you do and you're not doing that. Yeah. I mean, because honestly, when you step into a, 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 a game company, it has a bro culture, which is mm. the norm. Mm-hmm. You know this. Yeah. Uh, it, if, even if you weren't a bro before, you know that your survival, the company, depends on you being a bro. Yeah. If you're a bro, you get invited to the Cosby suite and mm-hmm. you get to hang out and you're what become one of the cool guys and you get promoted. And if you're not, then you're the other. not going to be trusted. You're not going to be trusted and you're potentially problematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're and 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 if you challenge if you oh, and, yes. and, and this is a little bit different, different than the bro culture specifically, but if you challenge if you challenge this Darksiders, whatever, like I talked about in, in my Force Wars paper, mm-hmm. I talk about like this doomsday clock. And, and, and once you come out as not being on board, you start the doomsday clock. And this will be ticking the whole time you go, you're at the company. Every time you go in, you can hear the clock ticking. It's, it's the number of ticks before you're fired. Mm-hmm. And 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 like and and when I went into that that hotel room and called out the catfish, I knew I was starting the doomsday clock. I mean, and I and by then I I hadn't even started. I hadn't even worked on a single game at Wargaming. And so my doomsday clock started before <laughs> I even started. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so I part of the reason I I built these games so fast and worked so hard at Wargaming is I knew I was running out of time. I knew I, I, only, I only had so much time to, 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 to deploy these designs, you know, prove my research that, that it worked, uh, because that was, you know, uh, my research was pretty out there. Um, I mean, by company standards. And, and also just to improve the lives of all these people, because, uh, you know, uh, people don't make as much money in Eastern Europe. And, they, and these people are so smart. And so hardworking, and 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 despite maybe the conflicts that have happened in between the East and the West or over you know the the decades, they're really nice people, and so uh, I really enjoyed working with them, and and they really appreciated that I had no filter because they're not used to Westerners being like completely honest <laughs> with them, so. It, I think it, it went both ways. You know, I really enjoyed working with Eastern Europeans, and I really wanted them to have that success. And they already had a lot of success before I got there. Uh, oh, yeah. But I, I really wanted to make that keep going, you know, for years. And I, and I still feel like I was successful in doing that. I just feel a little bad that, you know, the, the trends that were affecting the rest of the industry ended up affecting board gaming also. Mm-hmm. And it didn't have, it didn't have to be that way. They were, they were being very successful without going on those trends. It, in a weird way, it reminds me of some of the stories I heard from, uh, I think it was Overkill, the ones who did Payday, and how, mm-hmm. like, so many, like, weird, like, stories came out of that, too, about, like, one of the co-founders, like, their brothers was, like, taking money going like these like very like extravagant trips they were going to build something in dubai like it just sounded like so weird and i mean payday 2 warped like when that game like for the longest time it was like incredibly successful and then after all that we heard that the company was like borderline uh, going bankrupt i think they did actually file for bankruptcy and they're now like trying to like claw back from like the abyss there but again it's like that like i said earlier that a lot of people don't know they'll never hear about what is actually happening at these studios and a company that you think is doing well or is only on the up and up could be you know the complete 180 of that when you actually get in there yeah well and and in, in in Russian culture or Belarusian culture, uh, you know, they have this impression that Westerners are not only not necessarily the most honest people, but, but also that they're a little bit spoiled, um, they're delicate, maybe weak-willed, 
<laughs> and so this is part of why, especially in the beginning, they were so tough on me. Because and, and, and this probably goes doubly for an American scientist. Because they probably thought, oh, how could somebody be more delicate than an American scientist? Mm -hmm. And so they were like really trying to break me to see if they could break me. Uh, because they, they, they needed to know if they could trust me. And they gave me, I mean, uh, they gave me uh, so much trust while I was there at the company uh, to do the things that I did. Um, in, in so many other different places. Uh, and they really treated me really well. So, uh, um, but, but in the beginning, like when I was in Belarus and I landed there in the, in the middle of the Russian winter, I mean, I'm from Southern California. What do I know about snow? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I went to an REI and just bought, I told them, I need like whatever I would need to, to go to Antarctica. <laughs> And bought all this, like, you know, extreme Arctic survival gear just to be able to survive in, in Belarus because I knew it was going to be tough for me. And, and uh, they, they put my hotel room, like, on the opposite end of the city from where the studio was. Well, not the opposite, but it was far. And, um, and, and they didn't tell me how to get to work. And, and I ended up <laughs> learning how to just walk to the studio in the snow. And, you know, they really appreciated that. They really appreciated that I was able to walk in the snow <laughs> to the studio. And, and the same thing when I was in St. Petersburg, I made sure to learn the transit system so that I, I knew how to get, you know, just walk or with some public transportation to the studio every, every day. And, and I just would eat at the, I would eat at the grocery stores and buy like, I'm vegan. So I'd be like eating beets and bread pretty much <laughs> is what I was surviving off of and some orange juice or something. And, 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 and while, and, and some of my coworkers didn't get this. They would fly out to Minsk or St. Petersburg, and they'd, go, they'd stay at expensive hotels. They'd go to expensive restaurants. They'd do those things. And, and um, they'd go back to Austin, Texas, and they'd be fired a couple of weeks later. And they just didn't, they didn't get it. They, they, they failed the test. <laughs> and that, that was a culture test. Yep. You know, Eastern European culture is very different than Western culture, and you need to understand that. I mean, that was the first thing I did when I arrived, is I went into the, to the, to the museums and all these places to understand their history and ask people about their history, because I wanted to know what, why they were the way they were and what their expectations are and what they valued. So I guess here's a question, and I'm not sure, like, if you can't answer this one, uh, let me know. Like, are you, like, in contact with anyone from Wargaming still? Like, do you have any, like, contacts with the company now? I mean, I used to talk regularly with my old boss, mm -hmm. uh, but he's not even there at, at Wargaming anymore. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, he was, he was the first American hired at the company when there was only 40 employees, and he's not at Wargaming anymore. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not even going to ask him why not, but I would imagine, you know, that he was not happy with the direction things were going and, and life in, in it. And, 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 I, and I'm pretty sure from talking with him that the fun times have been over for a while. Mm. And do you know Machine Stone is still doing... Um world warships like are they still like working with them or you know i you know i i you know, i don't i'm i i don't i don't know i don't know who's who's doing any of the design work right now i i assume it's the same people but it, but it may not be so i i, I can't uh, i can't say for sure and, and i don't want to say oh you know this person's doing this because who knows the turnover might be so high that it might be some completely new people in there doing stuff now uh but i mean uh i just know that there was machines on people then, and I haven't heard anything different. And um, even if it is, if even if they're now gone, they I'm sure they opened up the door for people like them to replace them. All right. Um, as a time check, we are over ninety minutes in. Um, I think we went through everything on your list. Is there anything else that? Yeah. No, I mean, if you've got questions, but I mean, that's. That's how we. That's how we got here, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's 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 not like it happened all of a sudden. It's just been, you know, it was a series of events, and 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 I really feel like that that period, you know, uh, between 2013 and 2015 was the golden age for wargaming. We did so many amazing things that are still, you know, 
employing so many people there in Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I and I think that's fantastic. I mean, I think that, you know, like, uh, other than the, a company that makes these humongous, like, tractors in Belarus, uh, mm-hmm. Wargaming is, like, the biggest employer in, in, in Belarus. Um, it, it's, it's just a... a it, it was transformative for their economy and for their culture and for their people. And, and, I, mean, I, and I love working with Eastern Euro- Europeans. I mean, like, we're seeing, like, in, like, the greater sense of things, like, more uh, countries really starting to embrace game development and trying to really establish themselves. Like, I've been contacting a lot of mm-hmm. Brazilian developers, and Brazil is mm-hmm. trying to really uh, grow in terms of like the mm-hmm. games they put out and their status in the game industry. And mm-hmm. it is like such a shame when you see like I I've been using the term like unforced fouls lately a lot to describe these kinds of things. Like when a company is like you know, they ever probably said, you know, they can do no wrong until they do. And then it mm-hmm. just got kind of goes downhill and uh, like you said, like it's never just you know flipping a switch one day and that you know all the good goes away. It happens more gradually, and like I know we were talking about this back in like 2019 with like again the whole loot box law and what this means for mobile games or just free to play in general. Like I still don't really have an answer for where these designs and where these games will go because i've played a lot of decent mobile games but they still have those dark side monetization elements to them and a lot of these games don't serve like if a game survives a year on mobile that's considered like you know the middle of honor for these studios and most of them do not and Again, like, it's that whole slash and burn mentality. And, like, when you have a company like Wargaming that, you know, last, that's still going strong for so long, like, you don't want to see, like, these kinds of issues. Because, like, we've said this before, like, once those cracks start to develop between the developers and the community, they're almost impossible to repair. Because you're always going to have in the back of your mind, you know, are they doing this because they care, or are they doing this just to try and you know, stab me in the back and take my wallet with this decision? Well, I, I, pretty much every business person I talk to tells me that you know if if it's if something's working, you stick with it. You know, and and they really aren't willing to consider a a significant change in technology or a significant change in business model or or heaven forbid uh, a shift in technological paradigm Mm -hmm. which is what i'm talking about uh something that radical does not happen unless one it's been proven somewhere already first or the old ways are just not working to the point where they are they're forced to look for a new technology um but but even before my my budget was was before my budget was blocked because of the fallout from the ukrainian civil war uh in wargaming uh, I actually got greenlighted to start doing live human neuroscience testing in our testing center in uh, in Florida. Uh, that would have changed gaming forever. And uh, and uh, and the the top neuroscientist that I was going to work with then, I'm now I'm working with him now. Uh, so uh, um, huge changes for the gaming industry are on their way uh paradigm shift in technology is and 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 i'm happy to say paradigm shift from people who uh, have the right moral character the right motivations that have the uh, the well-being of gamers first in mind so i mean you do the best you can when you have these, these quick moments in history where you have a golden age where you have all the right people doing the right things for the right reasons and they come together and they make, a great, they make great games and then you struggle for a while and then, it, and then it all comes together again. And I feel like right now I'm, I'm really hopeful for the future despite all the ugly because I see things coming back together again. Yeah. 
and like for myself the stuff that i do we're talking about like game design like more of an academia sense like i've had a few bit of pushback about like some of my topics and it is hard to convince people that there is a better way because like you said if it works why change it why try to adapt and it like you said like they'll adapt either because they lose money or they literally have no other option but to do it and that is often where we see things not working out for a lot of these studios and again like I keep going back to that loot box law because it's been in the back of my mind that what is going to happen to a lot of these companies if like any bit of legislation goes through, you know, denouncing or banning, you know, one or more of these popular monetizations. Well, I think just, you know, part of the shield has just been because these gaming companies have been really popular. And so, you know, it, politicians don't go after hard targets. They go after easy targets. And, and now you can see, you know, this, the tides are turning with, all, with the California taking the action they are. Uh, the, now the ugly is starting to come out. Yeah. It was all hidden by non-disclosure agreements uh, because you can't block disclosure between a, a, an employee and the government mm -hmm. that's protected. So uh, all the ugly is going to come out. And, and as the reputation becomes tarnished, now these companies become political targets. And that's when you're going to see political action against the gaming industry, which is really the worst case scenario, which I've been warning for almost a decade now that it was, the, the industry needed to clean up or this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the short term gains, you know, and they don't really think about what's long term for or even their companies. The companies don't even seem to be really like concerned about their long term existence. Yeah, because the, the investors just want the next quarter to be positive. Oh, yes, and, like, it's, again, like, I keep going back to Blizzard in my mind, like, we were joking, like, a few of my friends and I, we were, like, putting up, you know, is Blizzard going to end by, like, 2020 when the whole, you know, do you not have a cell phone the thing happened with Diablo 4, and then some of those stories, and, you know, we were, like, joking, maybe this is the end, but nah, it can't be, Blizzard's too big, and now it's, like, Maybe they are actually. Maybe, like you said, maybe the doomsday clock is finally starting to move forward for Blizzard. Well, and and wasn't the, the whole? Uh, I kept reading that the the Diablo Four was made primarily for the Chinese market. Yeah. Did you hear anything like that too? Yeah. That's the reason that they were saying that that, that that they were making the game that no one wanted was because they thought this was going to be Asia, especially China product and yep. uh now just this last week the news coming out that that china is restricting uh gameplay to three hours a week for minors and it's not just any three hours a week it's between eight and nine p.m on friday saturday and sunday yeah i mean that, that that's that's and then and, and what uh, uh ten cent lost 300 billion dollars of valuation mm. <clears throat> Yeah. That's just a mind boggling amount of value because because this is this is the this is going to crater the Chinese market. So all these companies like Blizzard and and uh, others, uh, Disney, who have invested so heavily in China, now they're uh they could end up eating it. Yeah. It must be awful for them. I wouldn't want to be in that situation, but they put themselves in that situation. Yeah. And like, we've been seeing, like, I know we'll probably arrive in the next few minutes, so we're kind of, like, getting off topic, but <laughs> we are, we've been seeing, like, so much in terms of developers really trying to evolve in the mobile scene in the last, like, three to four years. Again, I go back to a game like Genshin Impact, and I'm surprised we haven't seen more Western companies just, like, really take notes on what Mihoyo did with that game. And, like, uh, I just did a thing, like, I played that Marvel's Avengers game. Like, that came out, like, literally, I think, a month either before or after Genshin. And it was, like, Marvel super monetized, you know, single player of a well-known developer. Genshin Impact, you know, relatively unknown in the West, but still popular in the East. You know, 
MMO, or I'm sorry, just like free-to-play open world game, this game sold like gangbusters. Marvel's Avengers just, like, it just flopped for them. And I know they've been, like, trying to get it back. They're trying to right that sinking ship. But I think, what, as we were saying a few minutes ago, that the old ways of monetization, I think, just don't work anymore. Like we've said, like, consumers have gotten very wise to it. And they can tell whether, you know, implicitly or explicitly when they're playing a game, Am I actually playing this game, or am I just playing a Skinner box? And well, uh, the the bottom line is, it, if you are paying any attention, you know, and and certainly us journalists are all paying attention because we mm-hmm. we have to listen to to our consumers. Uh, they're you know we interact with them regularly. Uh, it, if you're paying attention, you know the old business models have reached the point where they're being rejected by consumers. Yeah. And, and, I, and it's, just, it's just as simple as that. And so if you don't have a business model that is agreeable to consumers, your, day, your doomsday clock as a company is now clicking. Yeah. And, and, and for some companies, that clock has been going for a while and they're running out of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the question is, where, do you, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? You think you're just going to jump to another company and that's, what's gonna, that's, where, that's, your, that's your exit strategy? What company? Mm-hmm. It, this, this, the, the, it's, it's an industry-wide doomsday clock now. We have to accept consumer-friendly business models. Sure, we can continue mm-hmm. to fight regulators and make them useless, but we have to proactively make those changes ourselves and not wait for regulators to force things on, uh, on us because consumers are going to do that. And it doesn't matter whether the, it, we can get away with something legally because regulators have been influenced. Oh, you were kind of cutting out there at the end. The last word was regulators. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying it, if the consumers reject our business models, then we're out of business because there's our income stream. Oh, yeah. And like going, like taking this back to like the mobile side of things, like one of the things I see from a lot of kind of later or what we're seeing today in terms of mobile games is that just a complete abandonment of what worked eight to nine years ago the whole idea of having to watch ads get resources these games don't do that anymore the idea of again uh, having fun pain or having purpose uh, quality of life issues no they don't do this anymore and i think like getting back this idea of kind of educating the consumers they're seeing the positives of these light side elements now are these games 100 percent light side no but when they do enough right and they don't do enough wrong, it trains consumers to go, well, if this developer didn't need to bug me with, you know, best offers and, you know, bad design or force me to watch ads, why, why should I play your game that's doing just that? Like, again, we only have 24 hours in a day. Like, there's no time to be playing something or something that you're not enjoying. And like you said, like we're we're seeing, I think, very like a kind of a slow moving car crash for a lot of these developers who are still trying to, you know, make a mobile game like King or Zynga did eight nine years ago. Well, I mean, I wrote about uh, one of my prediction papers. My prediction papers always seem to be accurate. <laughs> my one of my prediction papers was data implosion. And I, I explained that when the industry shifted towards using quantitative methods like data scientists and, mm-hmm. and uh, all, the, the, all the monetization systems that they were trying to create to, to kind of trick people into spending more money, that the money went, was taken out of the budget that was used for creatives. Creatives were laid off and data scientists were hired. And basically now games are being built by data scientists. And... and Ignoring the ethical or artistic or any of the, those things that, that, that the consumers care about for a moment, if you just look at it on its base, what you're doing there is you're hiring people that know how to raise the price of your product. And you're laying off the people who know how to improve the quality of your product. So that choice that the entire industry adopted at the executive level years back, back when I had already identified it in Force Wars and that implosion. 
was they chose to lower the quality of their products and to raise the prices. Now, obviously, if your industry produces a low quality, high price product, it becomes less attractive to consumers. And consumers start to look for alternative places to spend their entertainment budgets. And they do. And that can't turn out well for you. It's, it's not a long-term solution. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you can boost your prices initially and make some money, which, again, it, it makes the investors happy in the, sh in the short run. But this is a, a, a short-term boon, long-term bust. Mm -hmm. And and when after you've laid off those creatives and they've retired, like Chris Taylor, or they've gone on to to I mean I'm hoping he isn't retired. I hope he's just temporary. But you know, but and then they go off and do other things, or they literally retire. You don't get them back. You've lost that. Uh, so it's it's be very hard to replace that. And so you see things like Blizzard, where the the, the uh, influencers like Asma Gold are talking about how. They are either new content updates are happening more and more infrequently. Uh, they're increasingly stuck. Mm -hmm. uh, and increasingly so broken that they have to go back and fix them. That, that the quality of the creative stuff has is, is, is gone to a point where it's actually negative. It's literally negative. Uh, but the work they put into raising the prices and giving you new mounts to buy and things like this is... is is where it's at, and this is where all the focus is on, and 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 so really, that's the exact same thing that they're complaining about with wargaming is that they're like, well, you're not giving us any new content, but you're asking for more money. Yeah, this is not a situation that they wanted to support or stay in, but this is this is what they're doing. If you need to continue to either update your products, make them better for the consumer, so you can justify gaming as a service, because. Gaming as a service, if you're missing the S, you're not going to get paid. Where's the service? Yep. I mean, this is not complicated. Mm -hmm. no, anyone it's... except for executives, apparently. Yeah. I yeah. don't understand how this... <laughs> uh, I think, again, it goes back to the uh, short term versus the long term. That they don't... I, but maybe they don't trust these products to be multi-year developments that they just see as maybe like a two to three month get the money get out move on to the next thing but again develop consumers and this is especially true for like independent developers watching us they remember names they remember if you're the studio who made x and you cut and run or you're the studio who try to exploit you know monetization they have very long memories and brand is invaluable. Brand is everything. Ooh, and, yes. and, if, and if you're willing to sell off your brand, like you know, Blizzard used to be the golden child. Oh, yes. Anything they put out would sell because they trusted everything before inductive reasoning. Everything before had been a hit. So everything in the future will be hit. And that's true until it isn't. Yep. And, and it, when it isn't was for Blizzard was Diablo 3, which I wrote another prediction paper about. I'm sure you've read it. Mm -hmm. Three months, no, six months before it even came out, I predicted that was going to suck. And I explained in detail why it was going <laughs> to suck, just based on my knowledge of the business model they were going to use, that they didn't know how to deploy successfully. And I knew yeah. they didn't know how to deploy successfully. So, uh, and that was the real money auction house. And, 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 and that was the moment that Blizzard failed. And, and that broke the, 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 the image of invulnerability, where everyone just knew every game was going to be better than last. I, I still haven't played Diablo 3. <laughs> I did. I got, because of that, how bad that auction house was, I got my copy for free because I paid it off by selling items in that game. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, so but, I mean, but, but, but it's been downhill since then. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of it was the damage to the brand. Now people will wait to buy a Blizzard game and, and see what the review is. Instead of, like, when I had to buy my box, my signed copy of World of Warcraft from Fry's Electronics in 2014, I had to stand out in the cold mm -hmm. for more than eight hours mm. in line, waiting to get my copy. And when I got to the front of the line, 
and they handed my copy. I could hear them them yelling that they that they were down to their last fifty boxes, <laughs> and I knew there were two more hours of people oh, in line behind me at least. And and I ran out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> I jumped into the car and I told my girlfriend, "Drive, get the f out of here as fast as you can. There's going to be a riot." <laughs> and I could see people freaking out behind me as we were pulling out of the parking lot. <laughs> I mean, it, that, this was the level of enthusiasm people had for for it, they sold out. Oh, they, they had it, it took them it took them weeks to get enough product again so people could just log into the servers for World of Warcraft. And those days over for Blizzard. Yeah. Again, the brand recognition is worth its weight in gold. It's something that I've been saying to a lot of indie developers. And when you lose it, that is usually what sinks that company. And I forgot, like, we were talking about Blizzard controversies. So the whole thing about, uh, I think it was like Free Hong Kong uh, from last year or whatever. Yeah, Blizzard that... Chung. Yeah, that Blitz one. Chung. And. Yeah. It... And again, like it's really interesting about we we're just talking about you know China restricting video game I, access. I, I was working for Immutable at the time, and we 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 told Blitzchung we would cover the money that 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 Blizzard was trying to steal from us. <laughs> we were going to reimburse him for the money that that Blizzard said they were now no longer going to give him that he had earned in that tournament. Mm-hmm. And that that created that created a huge amount of positive buzz buzz for Immutable. That was a huge PR victory for us. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyways, anyways, I probably we probably should wrap it up before I, I say any, too much more that'll get me in trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was definitely great chatting. I think this is one of those casts I want as many people to hear about. Not only just because of you know the issues with war gaming, but just like kind of like what is happening or this state of you know, this, like, culture war that's happening with free-to-play and mobile games in terms of these light and dark side mechanics and how I think we both kind of feel that either the light side's going to win, hopefully, at some point, or the dark side will get crushed not by the light side, but by litigation and and legislation and a lot of... I think the light side just needs to be given a chance. Yeah. And once people have that choice because right now they're in a market that has no choice Mm -hmm. so if they have a choice between light side and dark side and you get to do do, to do a true a b and you see how much higher the light side products perform then you're going to see industry shift because then they're going to have clear irrefutable evidence that this is the way to make money and industry likes to make money yeah but right now there's no data because light side technologies either not be given a chance or they're deemed to not exist. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, once that's been proven, and that's part of why I'm struggling to try to, to get one of these products to market, but they're, they're not simple products. They're complex. They're not, that, they're, they're not cheap to make. They're not fast to make. But when you do, you know, I, I like to think that they will render dark side products non-competitive. And because consumers will say, I'm not playing that when I can be playing this. It's just yeah. that simple. Definitely. But, yeah, I think we'll wrap things up here. I guess, any new updates regarding the game that you are working on right now? We've been in stealth for a year and a half, and, and, and I've been designing intensely that whole time. So you can see, if it took me 11 weeks to do World of Tanks Blitz, and it took me 14 weeks to do uh, the metagame for War the Warships, and it took me three weeks to do the, meta chain, the, the blockchain meta design for Gods Unchained, uh, and then six months to do the, which was a long time, a huge time for me to do the, the meta game for um, Guild of Guardians. Uh, you can, I'm not even close to done, and I've got a year and a half in the, on the design for, for Star Garden. So uh, that's going to be, that's just going to be transformative. But, uh, but we don't have anything to show you yet. We're, 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 um, but soon, hopefully, we'll, soon we'll have stuff that we can do some revealing. All right, and definitely best of luck with that. Thank you, sir. So, 
Uh, Ramin, as always, has been a pleasure hanging out with you. For people watching, if you want to hear more of our conversations, Ramin is part of our game dev roundtable that we try to meet every month for a topic. And I'm sure, like, uh, as I was telling Ramin, as for those of you watching, hopefully know, I'm working on my fifth book talking about free-to-play design that will hopefully be done sometime in January. And I'm sure I'll have a lot of questions for you between now and then. Thank you, sir. All Always right. a pleasure. Yep. So, uh, with that said, everyone, we're going to wrap things up here. I'll include links to the uh, articles and design papers that me mentioned in the description down below. If you're new, do the my four social media, the liking, subscribing, and all that for the channel. You'll find links to my Discord and Patreon down below. And if you are a developer working in the industry and want to come on and chat about your projects or design in general, we're always looking for guests, so please reach out. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. Until next time, take care.